Ever double-checked your locks at night? Dive into Boston's chilling unsolved mystery. Did they really catch the strangler? Stay if you dare. Mary Sullivan, a lively spark at 19, had her eyes wide with dreams as big as the city of Boston itself. Those eyes, ocean blue, were often clouded with the reflections of her new home, streets teeming with strangers and possibilities. She was a small town girl, and everything about Boston screamed of opportunities that whispered to her every waking moment. But under the skin of those dreams, something gnawed at her, a feeling she couldn't quite put her finger on. It was as if a shadow were following her, not quite touching, yet never truly going away. Friends said it was just the big city jitters. Even her dear mother's voice over the phone carried that reassuring note, like warm tea on a chilly day. Yet, the feeling persisted. Mary tried to quash it, drowning it with her vivacious laugh, her spontaneous dance in the middle of her tiny apartment, her dreams penned in a diary filled with doodles and youthful poetry. A nurse, she'd often tell herself. I'll be a nurse and I'll save lives. Her job at the department store was just a stepping stone, a means to an end. She loved the hustle, the bustle, and the bright lights of the city. The friends she made, the fleeting romances that made her blush, all of it was exhilarating. It was life, raw and untamed, and she was ready to embrace it whole. Yet the shadow never left her. It lingered in the corners of her eyes, in the creaks of her new apartment, in the silence of the night when the city's noises dimmed to a distant hum. It was there, uninvited, unseen, an omen, perhaps. A looming dread, a premonition dressed as anxiety. She'd glance out her window, down to the street below, the cars passing, people laughing, lives moving. And for a brief moment, she'd see it. A figure, standing, watching. Then, in a blink, it was gone. Was it her imagination? Or was it something more? Those who knew her saw a happy young girl, taking on the world, unafraid. But Mary knew better. Something was out there, and it was waiting. Winter had wrapped Boston in its cold, unforgiving grasp. The year 1964 held the city in a timeless freeze, a freeze that seemed to linger not just in the air, but in the very bones of the buildings and streets themselves. It was a winter that refused to smile, a grim season filled with ice that didn't sparkle but cut, wind that didn't cleanse but stung, and a sun that hid more than it revealed. The alleys were filled with the echoes of hidden lives, the poor huddled around makeshift fires, the homeless seeking shelter in the crevices that the city reluctantly offered. A labyrinth of despair, these alleys wound and twisted, mimicking the human condition they bore witness to. The city's vibrant history was sullied. The darkened sides that were often hidden had started to emerge, like scars beneath a facade. Snow fell, but not in the gentle, graceful way one might romanticize. No, this snow was different. It came down in heavy, wet clumps, sticking to everything it touched, and covering the grime with a deceptive beauty that lasted but a moment. Then, as the city's filth began to seep through, the white turned to a sludgy gray, a visual symphony of the city's dichotomy. Boston's winter had become a metaphor for something more sinister, casting shadows that seemed to lurk, waiting. Buildings that once stood proud now looked weathered, their faces etched with lines of worry. Streets that were once the city's arteries were now clogged, filled with tension that could be felt but not seen. People went about their daily lives, bundled in layers, heads down, hearts hidden. The cold had made them insular, retreating into themselves. The laughter was gone, replaced by a silence that spoke volumes. It was a silence that could be felt in Mary's apartment, in the vacant stare of the buildings outside her window, in the distant howl of a night that seemed darker than usual. Boston was holding its breath, anticipating, fearing, knowing that something was not right. The winter of 1964 was not just a season. It was a presence, a character in its own right, casting its shadow over the city, foretelling a darkness yet to come. The people of Boston had a ghost, 
It haunted their newspapers, their televisions, their hushed whispers, and their hurried glances. The ghost was elusive, intangible, but its effects were very real. Its name was whispered in horror and disbelief, the Boston Strangler. Mary, like most people, had read about the murders, skimming through the newspaper articles with morbid curiosity and a tinge of terror. Thirteen women, all strangled, all bound by a common thread of violence so terrifying it chilled the very marrow. The reports were artfully written, never quite giving all the details, but providing just enough to set the imagination ablaze. A scarf, a stocking, a glimpse into the dark mind of someone who could carry out such crimes. The words danced around the truth, hiding the most brutal details, yet they clung to the minds of the readers, weaving nightmares and fears. No one said it out loud, but everyone knew. The Strangler could be anyone. A neighbor, a friend, a stranger on the street. Trust had become a scarce commodity, replaced by suspicion and fear. Women double-locked their doors, looked over their shoulders, held their breath in elevators, and gave wide berths to men they didn't know. And all the while, the Strangler continued his grim dance with death, each victim another note in a macabre symphony. The police were baffled, the public terrified, and the city held captive by a phantom menace. Mary felt it too, that lingering dread that had followed her since her arrival in the city. Was it just the fear of the unknown, the anxiety of a small town girl in a big city? Or was it something more, something connected to the dark shadow that loomed over Boston? The Boston Strangler was more than a murderer. He had become a symbol, a manifestation of the city's darkest fears and hidden sins. His acts were a brutal reminder of the thin veneer of civilization, of how quickly it could be peeled away to reveal the primal horror beneath. And as the winter wore on, the terror grew, a slow, insidious creep into the hearts and minds of a city trapped in a nightmare from which there seemed to be no waking. Mary's new life was a whirlwind of excitement and trepidation. Her days began with the chill of the early morning, rushing through the Boston Common, the oldest city park in the United States, filled with ancient trees that had borne witness to centuries of life. Her breath visible in the frigid air, she'd make her way to the department store on Washington Street, her heart beating in rhythm with the clatter of the city. Boston was alive, teeming with energy, and Mary was part of it. Her job at the department store was more than just a means to an end. It was a doorway to a world she had never known. There, amidst the racks of clothing and counters of cosmetics, she made friends, real friends, women who were like her, dreaming and reaching for something more. Lunch breaks were spent at the local diner, a place filled with the aroma of clam chowder and the sound of laughter. They'd talk about everything, from the latest fashion trends to the handsome men who frequented the store. Boston's culture was not just something to be observed, it was something to be lived, and Mary was diving in head first. Her evenings were a mix of explorations and new experiences. The theaters on Tremont Street, the art exhibits at the Museum of Fine Arts, the historic charm of Beacon Hill, all of it was a delightful discovery. She would walk the Freedom Trail, tracing the steps of history, feeling the echoes of the past mingling with the present. Yet, with all the excitement came a shadow of fear. The city was not just a place of dreams, it was a maze of unknowns, a place where anything could happen. Mary's small-town innocence sometimes clashed with the gritty realities of urban life. The jostle of the subway, the cold indifference of strangers, the hidden pockets of poverty. It was a world that demanded caution and awareness. Her new friends were her anchors, guiding her, teaching her the ways of the city, showing her the ropes. She learned to walk with purpose, to keep her purse close, to navigate the complex streets with a newfound confidence. But even as she embraced her new life, the sense of looming dread never completely left her. It was there, a subtle undercurrent, a pulse beneath the surface, a reminder that all that glitters is not gold. Boston was her new home, a place of dreams, friendships, and adventure, but it was also a place where shadows lingered, where the unknown waited just around the corner, 
where a young girl's hopes and fears danced in a delicate balance. Mary's awareness of the Boston Strangler's existence was like a cold draft seeping through the cracks of a poorly sealed window. She felt it in the shiver that ran down her spine when she read the headlines, in the way her friends exchanged worried glances, in the extra bolt she slid into place when she locked her apartment door at night. Conversations with family were strained, their voices filled with concern. Are you being careful, dear? Her mother would ask, her voice trembling. You know about the Strangler, right? Don't go out alone at night. Please, promise me. Her friends were no different. The talk in the break room, once filled with laughter and gossip, was now dominated by the latest news about the Strangler. Each new detail, each new victim, was dissected and discussed with a morbid fascination tinged with fear. Precautions became part of her daily routine. She started to carry a small can of pepper spray in her purse, always within reach. She avoided dark alleys and desolate streets, choosing instead the well-lit paths crowded with people. The nightly news, with its constant updates on the Strangler, became a grim reminder of the dangers that lurked just outside her door. Her awareness transformed into obsession. She found herself glancing over her shoulder more frequently, eyeing strangers with suspicion, jumping at unexpected sounds. The city that had once been a place of excitement and opportunity was now a maze of potential threats. And with that awareness came a growing sense of isolation. The vibrant community she had embraced seemed to draw inward, each person retreating into their own bubble of fear. The connections that had once been so strong began to fray, replaced by a shared sense of vulnerability. The Strangler was no longer just a headline or a distant threat. He had become a dark presence in her life, an unseen force that cast a pall over everything she did. He was the whispered conversations, the nervous glances, the sleepless nights. He was the embodiment of fear itself, a fear that was contagious, spreading like a virus, infecting her thoughts, her actions, her very soul. And as the weeks wore on, that fear took root, growing and twisting into something more profound, something more personal. It was no longer just a general unease, it was a targeted dread, a growing suspicion that she was not just a bystander in this dark drama, but a player, a potential victim. The Boston Strangler had become a part of her daily life, a shadow that followed her, a ghost that haunted her dreams. And as the city shivered in the grip of winter, Mary found herself trapped in a nightmare of her own making, a nightmare that was only just beginning. The strangeness began with a fleeting glimpse, a man standing at the corner of the street, his eyes locked on her. He was there, and then he wasn't, disappearing into the throng of people. Mary shook her head, dismissing it as a figment of her overactive imagination. But then came the phone calls. At first, they were nothing more than a nuisance, the line going dead as soon as she answered. Annoying, certainly, but easily ignored. Until the calls became more frequent, more insistent. The silence on the other end grew heavy, oppressive, charged with an unspoken threat. Her friends tried to reassure her. Probably just a wrong number, they'd say. But Mary couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to it. The calls left her rattled, her hands trembling as she replaced the receiver. The feeling of being watched intensified. Faces in the crowd seemed to linger too long, eyes following her with an unsettling intensity. She'd catch a reflection in a window, a figure just out of sight, a presence always just beyond her reach. Her apartment, once a sanctuary, became a place of uncertainty. Shadows seemed to move on their own, noises took on a sinister quality, and the walls closed in around her trapping her in a web of fear and paranoia. She reported the incidents to the police, but their response was lackluster at best. Lots of strange people out there, they'd say, brushing her concerns aside. Just be careful and lock your doors. But how do you lock out a feeling? How do you escape the sensation of eyes on you, the prickling on the back of your neck, the cold breath of fear that follows you wherever you go? Her life became a twisted game, each day a new level of terror. She started to see him everywhere, the man from the corner, 
his face a blank slate, his eyes cold and unfeeling. He was there, but he wasn't, always just out of reach, always just a step behind. Her dreams were haunted by visions of him, his voice a whisper in her ear, his touch a chill on her skin. She'd wake in a cold sweat, his image burned into her mind, a phantom that refused to leave her. The boundaries between reality and fiction began to blur, the tangible world giving way to a nightmare of her own creation. Was he real? Was he a product of her fear? Was she losing her mind? The suspense was a living thing, a monster that fed on her terror, growing and twisting into something uncontrollable. She was caught in its grip, a puppet on its string, dancing to a tune she could neither hear nor understand. And as the days turned into weeks, the nightmare grew, the fear deepened, and Mary found herself trapped in a horror story of her own making, a story that was far from over, a story that had only just begun. Mary's final day began like any other, a routine so well-worn that she could navigate it in her sleep. The alarm rang at 6.30 a.m., a harsh and unrelenting sound that tore her from the terrors of her dreams. She sat up, her heart still pounding, the remnants of the nightmare clinging to her like cobwebs. The mirror reflected a face pale and drawn, eyes haunted, but she pushed the fear away, covering it with makeup, hiding behind a mask of normality. The shower was hot and scalding, a temporary refuge, the water washing away the terror, if only for a moment. Breakfast was a hurried affair, toast and coffee, the clock ticking away the seconds, each one a reminder of the day ahead. She dressed with care, choosing a bright dress, something to lift her spirits, something to chase away the shadows that seemed to follow her. The bus ride to work was uneventful, the city passing by in a blur, the faces of the other passengers a sea of indifference. She tried to lose herself in a book, but the words were meaningless, the story a hollow echo of her own fear. Work was a distraction, a place to lose herself, a place to pretend that everything was normal. Her colleagues smiled and laughed, oblivious to the darkness that had settled over her life. She joined in, the act almost convincing, but the undercurrent of dread was never far away, a constant companion, a whisper in her ear. Lunch was a quick bite at a local diner, the food tasteless, her appetite gone. Her friends chatted and gossiped, their voices a dull roar, their laughter a distant sound. She smiled and nodded, her mind elsewhere, her thoughts on the man from the corner, the mysterious phone calls, the feeling of being watched. The afternoon dragged on, the hands of the clock moving too slowly, the hours stretching into eternity. She tried to focus, tried to lose herself in her work, but the fear was there, lurking in the corners of her mind, a snake waiting to strike. Finally, the day was over, and she was free to go, but the relief was short-lived. The journey home loomed large, the city a maze of shadows and dangers, the streets a twisted path leading to the unknown. She said her goodbyes, her voice light, her smile forced. Her friends waved and called out, their words lost in the noise of the city, their faces already fading into the distance. And as she stepped out into the cold winter air, the weight of the day settling over her, the dread returned, a cold hand on her heart, a voice in her ear, a shadow that refused to leave. The sun was setting, the sky a tapestry of fire and ice, the city bathed in a golden glow. But for Mary, the light was fading, the darkness closing in, the end of the day a harbinger of things to come, a prelude to a night that would change everything. The weather had turned, Boston's evening sun had been swallowed whole by a mass of thick, foreboding clouds, and the first hint of a chill wind teased at the edges of Mary's coat as she disembarked the bus. The streets were slick with a greasy sheen, the beginning whispers of rain that promised to turn into a downpour. She shivered, pulling her coat tighter around her slender frame, eyes darting, every sound a threat, every shadow a menace. The city had become a stranger to her, an unfamiliar and hostile landscape where danger lurked in every corner. Her footsteps echoed in the empty street, the clatter loud in the silence of the approaching storm. She walked quickly, her heels clicking against the pavement, 
a staccato beat that matched the pounding of her heart. The rain began to fall, fat drops that splashed against the ground, the sound loud and insistent. It soaked through her clothes, cold and unrelenting, a physical manifestation of her fear. The darkness deepened, the streetlights casting pools of yellow light that seemed to push the shadows away, creating pockets of darkness where anything could hide. She hurried, her steps quickening, her breath coming in ragged gasps. The wind howled, a mournful sound that seemed to speak her name, a cry that echoed in the empty streets, a warning of things to come. She turned the corner, her apartment building looming large, a sanctuary that seemed impossibly far away. She could feel eyes on her, could feel the weight of a gaze that bore into her very soul. She glanced back, but there was nothing, only the shadows and the rain. The fear was a living thing, a beast that clawed at her insides, a demon that whispered in her ear. She ran, her feet slipping on the wet pavement, her breath a ragged scream, the terror a physical weight that threatened to drag her down. The door was just ahead, safety within reach, but the fear would not let go, the darkness would not relent. She fumbled with her keys, her hands shaking, the metal cold and slippery. And then she was inside, the door slamming shut behind her, the lock turning with a finality that was both reassuring and terrifying. She leaned against the door, her body trembling, her heart a wild thing. The apartment was silent, the only sound her ragged breathing and the rain against the window. She was safe, but the fear remained, a shadow that refused to leave, a chill that settled in her bones. She knew, with a certainty that was both chilling and absolute, that something had changed, that something was coming, that the darkness had found her, and that it would not let go. The apartment was quiet, save for the distant patter of rain. Mary was soaked to the bone, her mind a turbulent sea of fear and exhaustion. But in the sanctuary of her apartment, she began to feel a false sense of security. Her senses were still heightened, every creak a potential threat, every shadow a hiding place. Her heartbeat slowly began to quiet, the terror retreating like the tide. She made her way to the bathroom, intent on washing away the filth of the city, the stain of her fear. The shower was warm, the water a comforting embrace. She stood there, letting it wash over her, letting it cleanse her, but the fear would not leave, a cold spot that the water could not reach. She dried herself, dressed in her nightclothes, and went to the kitchen to make tea. The apartment was warm, the windows fogged, the world outside a distant thing. Then it happened. The sound was soft, almost inaudible, a faint creak that she might have imagined. But she knew, with a sinking feeling, that she had not. It was the sound of a footstep, a weight shifting, a presence that should not be. Her heart leapt into her throat, her body freezing, her mind screaming. She looked around, her eyes wide, but there was nothing, only the shadows and the silence. Then another sound, a whisper of movement, a breath. She turned and he was there, a figure in the darkness, a shape that seemed to materialize out of the shadows. Her scream was cut off, a hand clamping over her mouth, strong and unyielding. The world spun, her vision tunneling, her body a puppet on strings. He was strong, his body a machine, his movements precise and calculated. He knew what he was doing, had done it before, would do it again. She fought, her body thrashing, her mind a whirlwind of terror and disbelief. But he was relentless, his strength a force of nature, his will unbreakable. Her vision dimmed, the pain a distant thing, her body a broken toy. She could feel her life slipping away, could feel the darkness closing in. She looked into his eyes, saw the madness there, the emptiness, the void. He was not human, not really, a monster that wore a man's face. Her thoughts were scattered, her mind a shattered mirror, the pieces reflecting a horror that was too terrible to comprehend. And then it was over, her body a lifeless husk, her soul a fleeting thing that slipped away into the darkness. The apartment was silent once more, the only sound the distant patter of rain. The world had changed, a light had gone out, a life had been extinguished, and the city moved on, unknowing, uncaring, 
The shadows deepening, the darkness growing, a monster lurking, waiting for the next victim. The morning after was gray and overcast, a dreary winter's day that matched the city's somber mood. Time moved on, indifferent to the horror that had taken place in a small apartment, unaware of the life that had been snuffed out. It was Patricia, Mary's neighbor, who first sensed something was wrong. The faint smell of something unnatural, a sense that things were not as they should be. Patricia's knocks went unanswered, her calls ignored. A creeping dread began to form in her stomach as she called the building manager. When they finally opened the door, the sight that greeted them was something neither would ever forget, a horror that would haunt their dreams and color their waking hours. Mary's lifeless body was discovered, her vibrant existence reduced to a lifeless form, a tableau of terror and despair. The room was a mess, a chaos that mirrored the violence that had taken place. The news spread quickly, a shockwave that rippled through the community, a cold hand that reached out and touched everyone who knew her. Friends and family were shattered, their world turned upside down, their belief in goodness and safety destroyed. Her parents, already aging and frail, were broken by the news, their lives forever altered, their joy turned to ash. They had lost a daughter, a piece of their hearts, and the world would never be the same again. The city reacted with a mixture of horror and fascination. The newspapers and television channels filled with the gruesome details, the community torn between morbid curiosity and genuine grief. People talked in hushed tones, their faces pale, their eyes haunted. Mothers held their children a little tighter, people looked over their shoulders a little more often, and the shadows seemed a little darker. Boston was in the grip of a nightmare, the streets tinged with a sense of menace, the very air heavy with fear. The Boston Strangler had struck again, and the city was a victim too, its innocence lost, its faith in humanity shattered. The apartment became a place of pilgrimage, a symbol of a tragedy that was both deeply personal and shockingly public. Flowers were laid, candles lit, prayers whispered, but the emptiness remained, a void that could never be filled. Mary's face was everywhere, her smile a poignant reminder of a life cut short, her eyes a window to a soul that had been taken too soon. The city mourned, the community grieved, and the world moved on, but the wound remained a scar that would never fully heal, a pain that would never truly fade. The moment the lifeless body of Mary Sullivan was discovered, the wheels of justice began to turn, grinding slowly but inexorably forward. The investigation was handed to Detective Phil DiNatale, a seasoned veteran with a reputation for tenacity and thoroughness. He had been following the Boston Strangler's trail with grim determination, a dogged pursuer haunted by the faces of the victims. The scene at Mary's apartment was one of methodical chaos. Officers moved carefully, collecting evidence, photographing the room, preserving the gruesome tableau. Dinatale's eyes were sharp, missing nothing, his mind already working, sifting through the facts, seeking the elusive truth. The pressure was immense, the public was terrified, the media was relentless, and the political heat was mounting. Everyone wanted answers, and they wanted them quickly. The mayor's voice was stern, his directive clear. Find the killer, bring him to justice, restore the city's faith. But the path was not straightforward. The strangler was cunning, his modus operandi shifting, his victims chosen with no apparent pattern. Leads were followed, suspects questioned, Alibis checked and rechecked, but the trail was elusive, the answers just out of reach. False leads were a constant frustration, a mirage that seemed promising only to vanish upon closer inspection. A mysterious car seen near the crime scene turned out to be a dead end. A suspicious individual reported by a neighbor proved to be a figment of fear-fueled imagination. The investigation was a maze, a puzzle with missing pieces, a riddle that refused to be solved. Time was the enemy, each passing day a wait, each ticking second a reminder of the urgency, the need for resolution, the demand for justice. Di Natale's team worked around the clock, their lives consumed by the case, 
their sleep haunted by the images of the victims, their waking hours filled with frustration and desperation. The city watched, its breath held, its nerves frayed, waiting for the break, the clue, the key that would unlock the mystery. The police were under a microscope, their every move scrutinized, their every decision questioned. The shadow of the strangler loomed large, a phantom that seemed to mock their efforts, a specter that refused to be caught. But Dinatale was relentless, his focus unwavering, his belief unshaken. He knew that the answer was there, hidden in the details, waiting to be uncovered. He knew that the killer had made a mistake, left a clue, provided a hint. It was a game of cat and mouse, a battle of wits, a contest of wills. And as the days turned into weeks, as the leads were followed and discarded, as the pressure mounted and the frustration grew, the pieces began to come together. The puzzle began to take shape. The image began to form. The Strangler's days were numbered, the net was closing, the trap was being set. Justice was on the march, slow and relentless, driven by determination, fueled by anger, guided by the unwavering hand of Phil Di Natale. The killer's reign of terror was nearing its end. The city's nightmare was almost over. The long road to justice was approaching its destination. The final act in the horrifying drama of the Boston Strangler began not with a bang, but with a whisper. A whisper that led to the arrest of a man named Albert DeSalvo. DeSalvo, a laborer with a complicated past, was first caught in the web of another crime. But as he sat in his jail cell, the whispers began. Whispers that connected him to the Strangler's crimes. Whispers that grew into a roar. Detective Di Natale was cautious. The evidence was circumstantial, the connections tenuous. But the clues were there, hidden in the shadows, waiting to be unearthed. A cellmate's claim, a resemblance to a composite sketch, a familiarity with the crime scenes. The pieces were falling into place. The interrogation was intense, a battle of wits and wills. DeSalvo was enigmatic, his demeanor shifting, his answers evasive. But the pressure was relentless, the questions probing, the atmosphere charged with urgency and expectation. And then, it happened. A crack in the facade, a slip of the tongue, a glimmer of truth. DeSalvo began to talk. He began to confess. The details were chilling, the descriptions graphic, the confession haunting. DeSalvo's words painted a picture of a mind twisted by dark desires, a soul consumed by evil urges, a man lost to his basest instincts. But doubt lingered. Skepticism hung in the air. Was DeSalvo truly the strangler? Was his confession genuine? Or was it a fabrication, a desperate bid for attention, a twisted game? The controversies raged, the debates were heated, the legal battles were fierce. DeSalvo's confession was dissected, analyzed, questioned. Some believed him, convinced by his intimate knowledge of the crimes. Others doubted him, suspicious of his motives, wary of his inconsistencies. The case was a puzzle, a conundrum, a mystery wrapped in an enigma. DeSalvo's guilt was never definitively proven. His confession was never fully accepted. The evidence was never completely convincing. The Strangler's shadow continued to loom, a dark and unsettling presence that refused to be banished. The questions remained unanswered, the doubts unresolved, the fears unallayed. Was Albert DeSalvo truly the Boston Strangler? Or was he a pawn in a more complex game? Was justice served? Or was the truth buried, hidden beneath layers of confusion and contradiction? The story of the Boston Strangler is a tale of horror and mystery, a saga of fear and uncertainty, a narrative of justice and doubt. It is a story that resonates, that haunts, that challenges. And in the end, it is a story that leaves us with an open-ended question, a lingering doubt, a haunting uncertainty. Who was the Boston Strangler? What is the true nature of the crimes? Will we ever know? The story of the Boston Strangler is not one that can be easily confined to the pages of a book or the words of a tale. It is a story that seeps into the fabric of a city, into the souls of its people, into the very essence of fear itself. It began with the tragic loss of Mary Sullivan, 
a lively and vivacious young woman whose dreams were cruelly snuffed out by a lurking evil. A symbol of innocence and aspiration, her demise marked the beginning of a nightmare that would grip Boston in its icy clutches. The terror of the Strangler was palpable, a shadowy presence that slinked through dark alleys, haunted lonely streets, and invaded the sanctity of homes. It was a terror that transcended the mere act of murder, becoming a symbol of the unknown, the unknowable, the unimaginable. The city was paralyzed, its people trapped in a never-ending cycle of fear and uncertainty. The crimes were brutal, the motives inscrutable, the killer elusive. Every knock on the door, every ring of the phone, every creak of the floorboard became a harbinger of doom, a reminder of the lurking menace. The investigation was fraught with twists and turns, false leads and dead ends, pressure and frustration. The police were caught in a maze of doubt and confusion, chasing a phantom that seemed always just out of reach. The arrest and confession of Albert DeSalvo brought a semblance of closure, a glimmer of justice. But the controversies and debates surrounding his confession cast a pall of doubt, a cloud of uncertainty. Was he the strangler? Was the truth uncovered? Or was it obscured, hidden behind a facade of legal maneuvering and psychological complexity? The story of the Boston Strangler is a tapestry of horror and mystery, a complex web of fear and doubt, a chilling saga that resonates with a haunting power. It is a story that defies easy answers, that challenges our understanding of evil, that forces us to confront the dark recesses of the human psyche. And it is a story that lingers, that haunts, that refuses to be forgotten. The terror of the Strangler is not confined to a specific time or place. It is a terror that transcends the boundaries of fact and fiction, a terror that speaks to the universal fear of the unknown, the dread of the unseen, the horror of the inexplicable. The Boston Strangler is not merely a killer, a criminal, a monster. He is a symbol, a metaphor, an embodiment of our deepest fears and darkest nightmares. He is a reminder of the fragility of life, the uncertainty of justice, the complexity of truth. And he is a specter that still lingers, a shadow that still haunts, a mystery that still baffles. The story of the Boston Strangler is not over. It is not resolved. It is not closed. It is a story that continues to resonate, to disturb, to challenge. It is a story that reminds us of the thin line that separates the ordinary from the extraordinary the mundane from the macabre, the known from the unknown. It is a story that lives on in the dark corners of our minds, in the hidden crevices of our souls, in the unsettling silence of our nightmares. As our story comes to a close, let the lull of this soothing ambiance continue to cradle you further into your journey of calmness and rest. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of your relaxation and sleep routine tonight. Remember, each day brings a new story, and each night brings a fresh chance to regenerate, to dream, and to become more of who you are. Good night, dear listener. Until our next story, sleep well and dream beautifully. <laughs>